thanks for those very kind words sir and a warm i think good afternoon to each and every one of you out here uh, the previous session has been very interactive i know that and i hope that we can make this session as interesting as the previous one i know this is the last session and the last session is always on a sunday morning a session where you're thinking that okay when do i go back home so i am going to try to keep you occupied for the next up or 20 minutes allotted to me talking about a topic which is very very relevant to us and why i say relevant to us is because in the indian context especially like you know today morning while i was reading i mean i still read about where before i come up over here and talk and when i was reading about the subject i went for breakfast and i realized the most active counter over there was the counter on the masala dosa and the live counter so and i was just actually thinking the amount of carbs that in a single breakfast in a single restaurant in our country that can be consumed is actually humongous and that really set you thinking wondering that you know what is it that we as a country can why do we consume so much of carbs is it our mindset is it the fact that we are basically an agricultural country is it basically because since easy availability of carbs there are so many questions that cross your mind while having that simple breakfast and you wonder what is it that makes us so carbocentric as a country when we know that it is carbs which are contributing in a such a big way to the glycemic variability when we know that it is carbs which are contributing in such a way to that huge amount of postprandial peaks that we are seeing and in spite of that we are still not be being able to reach at goal when i talk about glycemic variability i'm simply talking about excursions of blood sugar levels conventionally when we should talk about glycemia hyperglycemia we should talk more in terms of fasting pp and hba1c these were the three parameters we were talking about till we realize that there may be so many times when you may actually have an hba1c which is absolutely normal which i will show you in the next slide but still you have sugar a patient who is having huge amount of variability and does this variability have any amount of significance is what we will try to understand when you talk about glycemic variability basically talk about two types of glycemic variability one you talk about long term glycemic variability that is your patient is coming to every 3 months you are looking at the fasting pp hba1c maybe some smbg records over the last 3 months and then comparing to whatever you are seeing previously and trying to understand as to which direction your patient is going in the other kind of record which you are increasingly seeing now is smbg and cgms record agreed when you're talking in terms of time in range when you're talking in terms of glycemic variability when you're talking about mean amplitude of glycemic excursions which we are talking about now increasingly looking at cgms data we may not have cgms data in all our patients but there will be still a lot of patients who are doing smbg and will tell you ke okay, doctor sir many i did the same thing on two days you have patients who are admitted with you exactly same thing and you have a sugar which is showing something very different on day 1 and something very different on day 2 something very different in the morning and something very different in the evening and this is what you mean by glycemic variability when you look at a only an hba1c it may not be an accurate reflection of what you actually think is happening in your patient you may have two completely different pictures the upper end of the graph shows you a picture where you have a number of fluctuations you have a number of highs and lows and the lower end of the graph shows you a picture with very low glycemic variability with very minimal highs and lows but with a similar hba1c so are we doing our job when we are looking only at hba1cs and why are we talking about glycemic variability we are talking about glycemic variability because mind you friends it does translate into an increased amount of micro and macrovascular complications because it is associated with increased cardiovascular events and cv autonomic dysfunction and that is the reason along with the most important fact that these patients are at an increased risk of severe hypoglycemia is the reason we need to look at this more carefully this is what is happening to our patients post meals this is what is happening to our patients when they have post prandial hyperglycemia a absolute actually like a surge of inflammation and oxidative stress this surge is going to to some extent translate into smooth muscle cell proliferation probably plug instability and rupture along with cardiovascular disease and are we doing enough to prevent this what is it that is actually happening in our country this is what is actually happening we've always been a carbocentric country 
what is worrying if you look at the data from 1961 to 2011 if you look at the chart over there what you would realize is that our calorie intake has increased from 2010 average as a country we've moved up almost by 450 calories and that is alarming it is alarming because on the other hand we become increasingly sedentary we don't move from our places even to pick up the phone, forget doing anything else in life. So it has become so, so sedentary. Add to it the fact that, you know, home cooked food is something which is just not so in at this point of time. Every restaurant, especially I know in Mumbai city, is going to involve a one hour waiting time on a Sunday evening, on any weekend. That is the kind of lifestyle changes we have made and that is what is increasingly contributing in a very, very big way to our issues. When you look at the STAR study, you would realize whether you're a diabetic or a non-diabetic patient, your carb intake is going to stay more or less around 60% and 60% plus. So that's where you are. So what do we do about this? Is there something you can do other than lifestyle? I know the first answer which I will get and which I all the time talk about is lifestyle. Is that enough? Can we do something else for our patients? And that is the background on which I'm going to talk about the Remit GV study. You would wonder, you have, you at this point of time are using two gliflozins very, very comfortably. You are very, very comfortably. The reason I'm saying two gliflozins very, very comfortably because the market data shows that those are the two gliflozins which are used very, very commonly in our country. So why am I talking about something else? Why am I talking about remogliflozin? Always the issue has been when we come out with any kind of Indian data, I mean, any kind of data is okay, what is the Indian data? What, where do we stand as far as India goes? What kind of evidence do we have that this molecule works and maybe works better in our scenario? That is what I am going to talk about over the next 10 minutes. That what is the data which shows that yes, potentially, remogliflozin, which we had started using, but then I think in the current din and noise, and with the issue about whether we have data, we don't have data, it has somehow gone on the back burner. What kind of data do we have? As far as a 24 hour glucose profile is seen in these patients of type 2 diabetes. And what was the thought process behind this? Other than the fact that it is an SGLA2 inhibitor and all that which is up over here, the basic thought process which went into this was that if you look at the meal pattern of our patients, or even if you look at our meal patterns, the predominantly two meals which we have in a day. It could be either a breakfast and a dinner, or it could be a brunch and a dinner, but most commonly that is the meal pattern which is followed in our country. And looking at the fact that we as a country are dealing with a lot of postprandial hyperglycemia, could we potentially be tweaking our molecules in such a way that we could actually deal with this postprandial surge in a better way? Is there any evidence that, as I showed you, apart from targeting the HbA1c, could we actually target these postprandial surges is what the thought process was. And why was Remo over here used as a comparator? Because we all know Remo is used twice a day. It has a short half-life. Absorption is within 15 minutes on an empty stomach prolonged to around, around uh, 45 minutes on a full stomach. So there are certain advantages when we were using Remo and that is the thought process actually behind this study. The primary objectives are very simple. CGMS data was going to be compared in Indian patients, a 24 hour glucose profile was going to be assessed by these parameters. And of course, these parameters were going to be obtained from CGMS along with, of course, your HbA1c. Whenever you're looking at any data, you are going to look at safety and tolerability. And this, the comparator was DAPA, where we know we have a huge amount of data with DAPA. So that was the comparator in this study. This was a randomized two-arm parallel group, open label study. Patients which were recruited for the study were uncontrolled patients. These were on stable therapy of either metformin or metformin DPP-4 inhibitor, which is something which we very, very commonly see. This is a very, very common scenario. The treatment duration, mind you, was a little short, only six weeks, so that could be a critic of the study that the treatment duration was short. But in this treatment duration also, what we see is something which I will show you. And there were 33 patients in both arms done in four centers, Dr. Seti's center, Dr. Irande's, Dr. Modi's center, and Dr. Shrikan's center. 
the in, I, inclusion criteria is up here for everybody to see, as I said, stable therapy, HbA1c 7 to 9 percent, and these patients were dietary compliant, mind you. So these were not patients who were dietary non-compliant. These are patients who had received advice from a dietitian or diabetes educator, and these were patients who were going to be followed up. This is the way the study data was. If you look at this, the CGM device was implanted on day one. Patient was not on either Remo or DAPA on day one. Patient was just implanted the CGM device. If you realize over here, seven days down the line, the patient either was randomized to, this was an open arm study, open label study. So either to Remo, 100 milligram twice a day, or to DAPA, 10 milligram once a day. On day 15, the CGM device was disconnected and the data was captured. This was as defined as phase one. Subsequently, the duration of the study was six weeks. This was continued up to 49 days. And in the last 14 days, again, a CGM device was implanted. And it was seen what kind of data we are going to generate at the end of six weeks. So this was the basic plan of the study. And if you compare the data between, compare the basic characteristics between both these patients on Remo and DAPA, you would realize they are more or less comparable. The only area where they were not comparable, mind you, was the patients who were on Remo had a longer duration of diabetes. This was just by chance, not intentional. But the patients who were on Remo had a longer duration of diabetes vis-a-vis -vis patients who were on DAPA. So that was the only area in the parameters, in the demographics, which was different. Now, when you compare the glycemic parameters as baseline between Remo and DAPA, you would realize there was no real major change, which was statistically significant. And HbA1c, which was comparative, if you look at the time in range, again, reasonably comparative, 66 versus 69. And if you look at the MPPGE and the post panel sugars, again, comparative. When you compare, now the second comparison which was done was between the baseline and phase one, which I said was one week after these patients were put on DAPA or Remo. And what did you see in this? Again, over here, you would realize that yes, when you compare baseline data in both the groups, there is statistically significant improvement in both the groups, whether it is DAPA or it is Remo. So no difference in the baseline to phase one when you compare both the groups. That is all significant. Now when I look at comparison between baseline to phase two, what do I see? Again, I see that there, the molecules do make a difference. The molecules do make a very, very important statistical difference in all the parameters. CV really cannot be compared because we all know CV is a long-term parameter. But when you look at all the other parameters, definite improvement seen in both the groups, mind you. That is something which is important. Except when you look at this, when you look at this parameter, the last three rows, if you see in the Remo group, what you would realize is when you look at the mean postprandial glycemic excursion, the last three rows, I just want you to keep this in mind. I'll be talking about this a little more in detail that this was different as far as the Remo group went. So when you look at the MPPGE, when you look at the post panel at one hour, and when you look at the post panel at two hours, yes, this was statistically significant in the Remo group. What does this translate for me? I will talk about in a little time. The basic conclusion, the primary outs and but the primary uh, parameter which was assessed in this study which was the baseline study. When you look at this, the T time in range value in both Remo and DAPA, what you find is that there is a significant improvement from baseline to phase one and phase two with both. No difference in the improvement. So yes, there is no difference as far as improvement is concerned. So where is the difference? Why are we talking about this study? Why am I talking about this in direct on? Does it have any implication for us? The implication that it has is that the postprandial glycemic parameters were statistically significant only, mind you, in the Remo group and not in the DAPA group. So though when you look at the HbA1c, there is no difference. But when we look at the postprandial parameters, there is a definite difference between the DAPA versus the Remo group. Subsequently, what does this translate into? 
this means that when you look at this change, there is a statistically significant difference with Remo both at breakfast and dinner. Is this an effect of Remo? Vis-a-vis, when you look at DAPA, what do you see? That this difference with DAPA is seen only at dinner time. I think this has a lot of implication for us in clinical practice because we often see in clinical practice it is very difficult for us to target postprandial sugars. You always see that your patient is doing well as far as fasting is concerned but may not be doing that well as far as PP is concerned. As far as one hour goes, again you would realize a statistically significant reduction in PP one hour with Remo but not with DAPA was seen at meal time. So you potentially could be having another molecule in your armamentarium which could be potentially targeting only postprandial sugars. Similarly, you would see a significant reduction at all meal times, but with DAPA only at breakfast and dinner. And this translates to you into a mean of mean change in CGMS 24 hour from baseline to phase two as more reduction with Remo compared to DAPA, especially at night time. And this is what it finally means. In a nutshell, this is what we could do to see to it that our patients are better at goal. This is the way Remo acts. This is the red line is your Remo plasma concentration. The blue line is the peaks which you are seeing with breakfast, lunch and dinner. And potentially we could be doing a better job with Remo vis-a-vis -vis your other glyphosins especially in a country like ours where we do have significant postprandial hyperglycemia. The last one minute to conclude, yes, this was an open label study, definitely short duration. We need more data, but this was a pilot study. I think we would be able to recruit more patients, have bigger numbers to really take this across. But what was definitely seen was that there's a significant improvement in time and range and HbA1c with both the groups. Most importantly, a significant improvement in postprandial glycemic parameters which seen with Remo but not with DAPA. And also very, very importantly, this was seen at every meal time with a similar adverse effect profile. So when we want to summarize, we need to look at glycemic variability. We need to understand postprandial hyperglycemia is a very, very important risk factor for cardiovascular parameters. We need to understand that we need to relook at our molecules to understand which molecule could specifically target postprandial hyperglycemia, especially in our country with a very, very hard, high carbohydrate load. And when we look at our molecules, we need to look at some of these parameters, sorry. We need to look at some of these parameters like MPPG, 1R and post and 2Rs postprandial sugars to be able to get our patients to goal. So, I would like to conclude by saying that Remo might be better in reducing glycemic variability with effective PP glycemic control in our Indian type 2 diabetic patients. We do need a change of thought process over here. Thank you very, very much.